All right, Revelation chapter 5, I did not finish. There's just a bit left there um, in Revelation 5. And uh, I knew the service would be a little bit longer uh, with the dedication and everything. Um, so uh, I hope we have, certainly have time to finish that part of it. Uh, but I wanted to take maybe this morning, Lord willing, uh, I want to be able to relate just a bit of a personal testimony uh, in regards to uh, the end times, how things are going to unfold in the end. And so I would like to get that done today if I can, and uh, that way we'll be ready to start chapter 6. So I just say that to you to say that it's not uh, some crafted uh, flowing sermon of three points in a poem, not that I ever have any poems, but just to communicate this, uh, just my final point of uh, Revelation 5 and then maybe an introduction type thing to chapter 6 as a personal testimony uh, where we'll kind of see some things we need to see. All right, but Revelation 5, to finish up and to say the things we did not get to say last week, in verse 13 and 14, that's the two verses we need, And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. Uh, let me uh, make a comment about the word amen and the use of it in the church. By the way, I think it is perfectly acceptable and right to say amen. You can even say amen out loud. I know that there are some that I've been around in my time that amen was said to everything. If you said the, uh, that the sanctuary burnt down, they would say amen. It was just like they thought they were supposed to say it no matter what. But a proper amen that concurs the truth of God's word is fine. It goes on in heaven, and it's okay to go on here. Now, I'm not going to beg and plead for you to give an amen to my preaching, but I do want you to know that saying amen to gospel truth is perfectly acceptable in the church setting. And so uh, I just wanted to, uh, just to communicate that, that amen is certainly the right thing to say when truth is proclaimed. Now, look at the, we're just at the very end, so just touching this together at the end, I just want you to see from chapter 4 through, we're moving somewhere. We're, we're moving to a fulfillment. Uh, I'm going to use the word consummation, where everything comes to its completion. And that is expressed in these last two verses. And so we've seen four living creatures, we've seen 24 elders, we've seen a myriad and myriad of angels and thousands and thousands, or you could say millions and millions, this great host surrounding this throne, all in a sense of unity, all in a sense of agreement, all with the perfect sense of worshiping uh, the one in the center of this place we call heaven. And so all of heaven without sin, without restriction, everything perfectly in this big, rounding roar of worship, if you will, uh, here going on in heaven, and this having these rippling effects of going out to the point that in verse 13, every creature in heaven, I don't want to beleaguer, uh, beleaguer the point, but to say there's not one single creature in the entirety of whatever we can conceive of as heaven there's not one that's saying, I won't worship. There's not one. Every single creature that is present in heaven is wholeheartedly, willfully, joyfully, energetically worshiping the one on the throne. Now, to any prohibit, prohib pro make up the word. <laughs> Every creature on earth, every creature under the earth, every creature in the sea, all that is in them. That's, that's where this thing is moving. So if you want to be in the right, I would say in the majority, move yourself to a position of true worship of the God of heaven because that's where everything is going. The worship that has begun around the throne will make its way to the end of the entire universe into one unity of praise for the great God of heaven, his work of creation, 
and his work of redemption through his one and only son, Christ. That is where everything is coming. And by the way, as say in, a, in a sense of a side note, I would say even all of those who are in hell for eternity are in a sense being a, a part of the worship of the living God because their presence in hell is a proclamation of the justice of God and that he did right. And so even hell by definition is a is a magnification of the attribute of the justice of God. And so all of heaven is worshiping and giving God glory because he's just, because he's all of the other attributes combined, but there's not a sphere anywhere that exists that won't be reflecting some attribute of the great God of heaven. Justice and mercy and love and unchangeableness and patience and all of the attributes of God all of creation is moving to that final day when this whole creation that is groaning under this time is going to flourish forth in a whole new earth and a new heaven in which everything, everyone in agreement to the worship of this great God. Now he gives about uh, four things or so here as descriptors to the one who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Now notice there are two, two uh, subjects, if you will, mentioned. You have the one who's on the throne, and you have the lamb. So the one on the throne and the lamb, every time in the book of Revelation where you have the one on the throne and the lamb, two people, you have a singular object. I'm not trying to be funny or creative grammatically, but you have two entities, and then you have an action to an object, and that object is singular. Every time in Revelation, why? Because the one on the throne and the Lamb, we give worship to not them, we give worship to Him. The one on the throne and the Lamb worship them. No, worship Him, because this Trinity is one. And John is careful to do that all through the book of Revelation. You see it very, very clearly laid out that for him, the one on the throne and the lamb make up one, not two. It's a very, very vital point to the deity of Christ. And by the way, it is very significant in the book of Revelation that no one ever receives a rebuke for worshiping Jesus. You're never rebuked. Here we're singing the song of the Lamb and worshiping the Lamb and saying that He's worthy. Our memory verse, Revelation 15, they're singing to the Lamb and nobody comes forward and says, don't do that. But if you do it towards an angel, stop it. I I'm created just like you are. Worship God. And so you get rebuked for uh, angel worship, but you do not ever get rebuked for worshiping the Lamb. Why? Because He's God. He's been revealed to us in human flesh, but all of Scripture consistently presenting Him as God. Now, I'll say just a couple of more thoughts on that. You say, well, I can't quite grasp that. That's fine. Neither is anybody else grasping it in its fullness. All we can do is take the truth of Scripture, communicate its truth, and say amen to it. But we have God the Father, we have God the Son, and we have God the Spirit, and Scripture presents them as one and shows their works individually, what the Father does, what the Son does, what the Spirit does, how they work together, how they have different roles, and then the agreement is they're God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. That's the way Scripture would recount it. You can see it in Ephesians chapter 1 that God the Father chose. You can see that God the Son redeemed. You can see that God the Spirit sealed until the day of redemption. You can look in Titus chapter 3, and you can see the, uh, when the goodness and the, and the kindness of our God appeared, he saved us. And then you can see that Jesus Christ is the redeeming one in there. And then you can see that it was by the pouring out of his Spirit, all working together in the salvation of man's soul. So three entities or three persons presented as one and called the Godhead. That is the foundational belief of Christendom, that they are three in one. Okay, uh, the, 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 the titles he puts here in verse 13, to the one on the throne and the Lamb, blessing, honor, glory, and might. Blessing, honor, glory, and might. 
Blessing simply the act of speaking in favorable terms. Praise. His worth demands the whole world to speak favorably of him. I think I mentioned this a bit last week because this one was in our previous list. But it is completely wrong and blasphemous to use the name of God, the name of Christ, the name of the Spirit in a negative fashion that demeans the name. It's blasphemy. What is required when we use the name of God is the utmost of absolute respect. If you watch any length or level of TV, whether it's a kiddie show or whether it's a bad show that you shouldn't be watching, they will manipulate and use the name of God in a negative fashion, which ought to make us revile against that and say, don't speak of my God that way. His name is not a byword. His name is not something you tag on the end in a negative fashion. His name is holy, and it demands our attention as holy, and his name is to be revered. Look, you can, maybe you can talk about this and talk about this and talk about this, but don't talk about my God in a negative fashion because his name is to be blessed, revered, honored. It should have the highest level of attention when it comes to to speech. Don't flippantly even on the end of your prayer say, oh yeah, Jesus' name. Jesus' name has meaning. It has emphasis. It has importance. And there's a ton that goes with his name. Secondly, it says honor. These are the things that are given to the one on the throne and to the Lamb. Not only blessing, but honor. The manifestation of esteem. Reverence. He is to be revered. Thirdly, glory. Doxa. Glory. Honor as enhancement or recognition of status. And we talked about this one before as well, so I will not belabor the point here. Fourthly, power. This one was different. It was not in our previous list in the verses before, but this word here for might or power. Might, power forever and ever. It's a different word, uh, kratos, uh, the word power to exercise ruling Exercise ruling ability. Exercise sovereignty. The word gets translated most often as the word dominion. Dominion. So there where it says might, you could actually translate dominion because actually that's the way the ESV translates it everywhere else. I don't know why they don't do it here. But this one on the throne and this lamb, they have dominion over the entirety of the universe. The universe is God's universe. The world is God's world. Every single thing that you can see, touch, or lay hold of belongs to God. It's very good for our understanding because it puts things in right perspective. You say, I'm going to give my... No, you're going to give what God let you borrow. You're going you're to give something that the Lord has allowed you to have, but if he didn't allow you to have it, you wouldn't have it because he has dominion over the whole Every bit of it belongs to him, including you. Including you, including me. I, I belong to the Lord, and so whatever marching orders he gives, the response is yes and amen because we are owned by him. Let me just give you a couple of verses on this dominion word, and you can hear how it sounds. In 1 Timothy 6.16, To him be honor and eternal dominion. To him be honor and eternal dominion. He doesn't have a temporary reign. And after it says eternal dominion, you know, it has a period. And you know what the next word is? Amen. That's what it says. To him have this eternal dominion. Amen. And so what is the scripture saying? That's right. That's true. Can't argue with that one. 1 Peter 4.11. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Period. And then guess what? Amen. That's what it says. 1 Peter 5, 11. To him be the dominion forever and ever, period. Next word. Amen. And so it's just it's, it's a verification of the truth. Jude 125. To the only God, to the only God. Notice how it says, to the only God, our Savior. Only God, our Savior, his Son who saved us, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now, and forever. Amen. That's what he says. 
Revelation 1, 6 that we've already looked at and made us a kingdom, priest to God his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. That's what they say. So in every one of those, it's interesting to me that in every one of these texts about his dominion, his rule, his honor, his glory, the scriptures put the word here, amen. And so it's a verification of that truth. These qualities that were listed back in verse 12, these qualities listed back in verse 9, and these qualities in verse 13, all of these qualities are applied to the Godhead, possessed by him. He's possessed them eternally. He's not grown in them. He's not shrunk in them. He's not made progress in them. He is of all of these. He remains deserving of all of this because of who he is. Now, in verse 14... You will see it in the last line after amen. Here's the response. The elders fell down and worshipped. The word worship, proskuneo, is to express in an attitude or gesture one's complete dependence. I'm, I'm showing my complete dependence on our submission to the highest of authority. So worship is, I, I'm suggesting by my worship that I'm absolutely, totally, unreservedly dependent upon the God who is on the throne and the Lamb who redeemed my soul. That's, that's, what, that's what I want to communicate in worship. That's why we're here in worship. We're agreeing as a church body that we are absolutely dependent upon the one on the throne. That's what worship is. Prostrate oneself. Fall down. Give reverence. Give respect to. By the way, we did this Wednesday night in Ezra chapter 3, but let me just footnote it here in, in the sense that that is a hard thing to balance in church life. It's hard. You have some that are all expression external. Then you have some that are all internal without expression. It's almost like being at a cemetery. It's like, how in the world can we bring this together and have a sense of passion, have a sense of urgency, have a sense of lifting up the voice and praising, have a sense of raising the hands and worshiping the living God, which is perfectly acceptable in Scripture to lift your hands and to pray and to worship, to fall prostrate and lay on your face before God. All these things are biblical how can we have that have foundation biblical truth and have them in agreement together without going to either extreme that's a tough deal but at least we know that's right it's right to have zeal it's right to have passion but it's also equally right to fear the lord god to have reverence and to have respect and somehow that's at least the goal there's expression in heaven they're so loud it sounds like a great roar going off in heaven in ezra 3 they're shouting so loud that people can hear all across and their enemies can hear them so it's great expression but great reverence and somehow that is at least the goal of the church okay so let me transition here just a little bit. Now, how is all this thing going to end? How is all this thing going to end out? This book of Revelation, this is where we get all of these different theories. I'm going to throw out a few words. If you don't know what they mean, don't worry about it today. We don't have time to define these out, but I don't know how else to say them but just to say them. There are numerous end-time views, numerous, held by all kinds of different people. Pre-tribulation, mid-tribulation, post-tribulation, pre-millennial, post-millennial, all-millennial. And of course, as I was notably in history, a pan-millennial. It'll somehow pan out in the end. Uh, books are written every day, preaching, teaching, writing, blogs, internet. There is no end to this stuff, I assure you. And everybody that wants to say something has an opinion about the book of Revelation. Um, I don't have any reservations in stating that I'm an amillennial. We'll talk about that as time unfolds. I can defend my uh, positions as well as they can defend theirs. But there's a truth here in Revelation 4 and 5 that we can't miss. And I want to be careful to do that as your pastor. I don't want to get uh, mindlessly bogged down in a bunch of charts and graphs because there's no charts or graphs in Revelation anyways. And I don't want to get bogged down in all of that and miss the obvious because I know that's the danger, is we get into all these discussions about all these little things we want to fight and divide over on end-time views, and then we miss what was the clear truth that everybody should have got. Here's a real clear truth that we must agree on and that we must not miss. 
There's one sitting on the throne, and there's a lamb who went up to the throne and took the scroll, and he's the only one worthy to break its seals and to execute its content. And our God that's in heaven reigns. And we have to agree at least on that. We, you want to fight through the rest of the book? I don't know that you want to fight, but I know people fight over all these other issues. But if we get so lost in the fighting that we forget that this is what John was telling us, we're going to miss it. And I want us to know that no matter how this thing unfolds, whether, whatever view, end time views you take, whatever end time view you already possess, however it unfolds, this truth will never change that our God is in control of all the events of time. To quote one favorite theologian of mine, thus the entire universe is governed by the throne. That is, by God, through the Lamb. When the Lamb ascended to heaven, he sat down at the right hand of God, quote, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in the world but also in that which is to come. And he, God, the Father, put all things in subjection under his, Christ, feet, gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that fills all in all. Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. All things ultimately must glorify God. His will is carried out in the universe. The throne rules. The Lamb reigns. Hence, Believers need not fear the tribulation, persecution, anguish. Let the trials come. Let them come. Because our God reigns and he is moving history somewhere and you can confidently trust him. All right, is of necessity, let me just, this is testimonial, not expositional, uh, testimonial, in, and, and you can hold it in your thoughts, and that way when we get to chapter 6, you'll have this. But I need to say at least something here about an end-time view, and let me tell you why. Because if you have a, a, any type of study Bible, almost all study Bibles, there's a few that don't, but if you have any type of study Bible and you look at the end of chapter 3 or if you look at uh, chapter 6 and verse 1, chapter 4 and verse 1 in your study Bible, it's going to tell you that the church isn't here anymore. That's what it's going to tell you in your study Bible, and I think that they're crazy. And so uh, you're going to hear me saying the opposite than what the study Bible is saying. You're going to say, what's going on here? So I need to at least say something about that where you can be made aware of it. So here it is. This is just my testimony. I have been somewhat overwhelmed by the book of Revelation. I have been challenged uh, greatly by this book. Thus, I have read more than I probably need to read and continue to read every day trying to get some type of grasp upon these things. And so uh, the difficulty I have now is I have way too much in my mind and heart to communicate in one setting, and I'm afraid that just touching on this thing or the other thing is not going to do you justice and let you hear the entirety of what I'm thinking. And so I'm trying to be cautious. Here's my testimony. So up until this point, I can tell you this. I'm going to use the word eschatology, last things, how this thing's going to end. Eschatology, the end, how things unfold on those last days. I started with zero knowledge of the end times view that exists, and I could not even pronounce any of the names. Just telling you, that's where I started. You use those terms on me, I couldn't tell you how to even pronounce them. In the church that I grew up in, a little Southern Baptist church in East Texas, all I know is that every year we'd have a guy come speak on the end times. His name was Dr. Mike Amerson. He was a dentist, and he was an exceptionally intelligent uh, man. And he would come out every year and speak about end times. And, boy, it would really get my attention. He would speak about charts. He would speak about current events. I'll never forget, he said, you have to have your newspaper in one hand and your Bible in the other hand. That's the way you can figure this thing out. And he would tell us that every year. And he would talk to us about Israel. He would talk to us about the Middle East. He would talk to us about all of these current events going on. And he would try to identify who the Antichrist was and how this thing was going to end and how we could be prepared for these days. I remember I would ride home with my parents 
thinking that the Antichrist was about to show up at my house. I, it scared me. I was a kid, and it got my attention. And I thought, you know, this is bad, because if mom and dad don't get the mark on their hand or their forehead, we're not going to buy anything to eat, and I'm hungry. I, I was just a kid. I mean, it's just the way I thought. I thought, man, if I can't buy groceries, it's going to be a bad day. And so uh, for the next few weeks, we had talked about this mark of the beast, and it progressed into getting computer chips under the skin and all kinds of different things like this or some kind of thing up on a credit card, and if you didn't have it, your money wouldn't work. Uh, I remember also talking to my parents about how smart Mike Amerson was. You know, this guy told us all these things. Like, that guy's smart, you know. And I would go home thinking about the Antichrist, the mark of the beast, and how smart Dr. Mike Amerson was. It, uh, that's, that's just the effect that it had on me. It's just, that's my story. And I would say, actually, the entirety of my church experience was pretty much just like that. E every bit of exposure I had to end times teaching, that's what it was. Okay, and so that's just my growing up years and even my years as I came here to seminary. I never heard anything else other than rapture theories and, you know, Israel making a peace treaty and the Antichrist and the beast and all of these things. And I've heard all the discussions who the Antichrist is. You know, he's, he's the Pope, he's President Obama, he's uh, Titus, he's Domitian. I mean, all, of the, all these theories, that, that's what I have heard my whole life. So I came to seminary. And obviously my exposure to eschatology was increased uh, to a degree in certain classes. But I learned that there were other views. Now, in my seminary experience, personally my experience, there were other views uh, that weren't the typical dispensational view, but they didn't give much time to them or give any explanation to them. Or not, not to any great degree. Basically... Here's what the end times view is. It's a dispensational view. And all these other views, this is what they are, and they're bad. That's pretty much, not exactly, but to the degree, that's my end time view scenario at seminary. And by the way, it was the subject that was probably the least amount of my time in seminary. It wasn't something that we spent a lot of class time upon. And so all the way up through seminary, even to the day I came to this church, if someone was to ask me my eschatology all the way up until a few years into this church, I would have responded without apology that I'm a pan-millennialist. I'm just telling you that's what I would say. Because, frankly, I didn't have a clue. I didn't study. I didn't do an in-depth research into any end-time view or in the book of Revelation. And so I was content to say, I'm a pan-millennialist. It'll pan out in the end. I pretty much kept the same position of non-committal through 14 years of seminary. The bottom line... I was simply not willing, prepared, nor ready to study this because I didn't want to get bogged down in all the stuff that I considered somewhat of nonsense and deal with it. So that, I'm just telling you that was my position. I have, I have another subject just like that. It's called genealogy. I stink at genealogy. But uh, my wife, you want to know genealogy, talk to my wife. Don't talk to me. So, but end times was that way through most all of my life. Uh, you know, here's the deal. If John Calvin's not going to write a commentary on Revelation, I'm not going to read it. I mean, he never did write one, so I'm like, fine, I'm not touching it either. And so if the conversation came up about end times, I just sidestepped it and said, look, dude, you better repent and believe in Jesus. You're not going to heaven. I just, I just move around the whole thing. Just ignore the subject, as we learned the other day. I just stuck my head in the sand. Of course, my rear was still in the air, and you could kick me. That's the best I have, guys. That's the best I got. There were things, though, that began bothering me throughout my pastoral time at this church. I, I began to find things in the Old Testament and the New Testament that I didn't have answers for, and it began to bother me, and I wanted to have some answers along the way. I remember the first argument I got into. I got five minutes. I remember the first argument that I got into. It wasn't in this church. It was in another church that I was preaching at. And I don't know how Revelation came up, but it came up in a church in Tennessee and the person that I was having this conversation with, he told me, don't worry about it. After Revelation 3, the church is raptured out, and it's not mentioned again. Chapters 4 all the way through 19, the word church never shows up again. And I remember arguing with this guy, and I don't even know why I was arguing. I didn't even have anything to argue with, but I thought, that just sounds completely stupid to me. What do you mean the church? So I'm supposed to think now, from chapter 6 to chapter 19, I have nothing to tell you because it ain't about the church? By the way, just as a side note, I did some study this week. The word church is not mentioned in Mark, Luke, John, 1 Peter, 2 Peter, 1 Timothy, uh, Jude, or until the 12th chapter of the book of Romans. I'm like, do you want to throw all those out too? 
Ecclesia is not in any of those, I assure you. And so it's kind of a it's, a, it's not a very good argument to say, hey, it's not about the church because the word ain't there. We'd have to throw out three of the gospels. And, but I, I just remember having that argument with this guy and just thinking, this is crazy, but I, I didn't know what I was talking about at the time. And so it, I, I simply thought that it did not sound right to have the church gone and escape the tribulation. That just didn't sound right to me. In my view of church history... I cannot, I still cannot, conceive of any way possible to tell the last 2,000 years of Christian martyrs that what they're experiencing is not the tribulation. I, just, I can't fathom how you can tell 100,000 martyrs per year that they're not going through the tribulation. I remember, as you've heard me say before, I, I've stood in the room in Lima where they, where they executed 250,000 people in the Inquisition. I'm like, you can't preach a pre-trib rapture to these people in the Inquisition that are dying here. You can't. They're not listening to you. I've seen the torture racks there. It doesn't make sense to them. By the way, oh no, I, I can't chase that. There's another issue that was deeply embedded in my heart that I... But I didn't even know this had anything to do with end times. I, I didn't know. There's always been within my heart this, this discussion of Israel and the church. And I didn't even know what I was getting myself into. I probably don't know what I'm getting myself into this morning. But long before I ever studied eschatology, I was convinced that God had a plan. I always called it plan A. I just thought God had plan A and he's going to carry it out. And so... That's where I was, and from Genesis until the end, God was redeeming people by the means of the gospel through the substitutionary work of Christ. And I was, I'm, I'm still convinced of that. I don't see that changing anytime soon. I think he preached the gospel to Abraham. That's what Galatians says. And he made himself known to Moses. He gloriously delivered Rahab and Nahum, and he also did a great revival in Nineveh, and all these people are Gentiles, and he's saving Gentiles. And Psalms 96, he's saying, preach the gospel to all the nations, declare my glory among all the nations. And so... I, I believe these type of things. It's a core of my, uh, my understanding of Scripture. I just didn't realize that it was such a big issue when it came to end times. And so the gospel being proclaimed to all nations and that the church is made up from every people, every tongue, every tribe, and every nation, that's just bedrock solid for me. The Apostle Paul, he taught me no one is a Jew who's just one outwardly nor is circumcision outward and physical. A Jew is one inwardly. Circumcision is a matter of the heart by the spirit, not by the letter. And so uh, that's what Paul taught me. But I remember numerous times I would state my views of Israel and the church, and people would accuse me of teaching replacement theology. And I thought, I don't even know what they're talking about when they say replacement theology. I couldn't figure out what was being replaced. I was just stupid, you know? I'm like, what is, what is being replaced here? For me, because what's my position? It's always been about the church. You, you read the old guys, and when they talk about Genesis through Deuteronomy, they keep referring to the church. It's always about the church. And you go all the way through, the church, the church, the church. And so I 